Engaged, a farcical comedy in three acts, written by W.S. Gilbert in 1877, performed as a radio play by Newcastle University Gilbert and Sullivan Society, summer 2021. Chevy O'Hill, voiced by Luke Grange. Belvani, voiced by Nads Shams. Miss Simpson, voiced by Jessica Coates. Angus McAllister, voiced by Ben Gardner. Major McGillagoody, voiced by Eleanor Smith. Belinda Traherne, voiced by Olivia Shepherd. Ninny, voiced by Christina Clifford. Mrs. McFarlane, voiced by Susie Fletcher. Maggie, voiced by Olivia Irving Wilson. Parker, voiced by Inez Antunes. Narrated by Emily Wright. Directed by Georgie Holter. Act one takes place in a garden of a cottage near Gretna, on the border between England and Scotland. Act two and three take place in Simpson's house in London. Three months pass between Act 1 and Act 2. Three days pass between Act 2 and Act 3. Warning, there are brief discussions of attempted murder, suicide and guns. Act 1, scene. Garden of a humble but picturesque cottage near Gretna. The whole scene is suggestive of rustic prosperity and content. Maggie McFarlane, a pretty country girl, is discovered spinning at a wheel and singing as she spins. Angus McAllister, a good-looking peasant lad, appears on at back and creeps softly down to Maggie as she sings and spins and places her hands over her eyes. What is it? Oh, Angus, you frightened me, say. And see there, the flax is all knotted and scribbled and I'll do nothing with it. Meg, my Meg, my ain bonny Meg. Angus, why, lad, what's wrong with thee? I was teardrops in thy bonny blue eye. Do not heed them, Meg. It comes fra glowering at thy bright beauty. Glowering at thee is like glowering at the noonday sun. Angus, thou art talking foolishly. I'm but a poor brown hillside lassie. I didn't like to hear sick things from a straight honest lad like thee. It's the way the dandy town folk speak to me, and it does not come rightly from the lips of a simple man. Forgive me, Meg, for I speak honestly to ye. Angus McAllister is not the man to deal in screaming compliments. Meg, I love thee dearly, as thou well knowest. I'm but a poor lad, and I've little but twa broad arms and a straight heart to live by. But I've saved a wee bit, sir, of a broad hoosie and a scrappy of good garden land. And it's all for thee, lassie, if thou'll gie me thy true and tender little hair. Angus, I'll be fair and straight with thee. Thou askest me for my hair. Why, Angus, thou art tall and fair and brave. Thou'st a good, honest face and a good, honest hair, which is mere precious than all the gold on earth. No man has a word to say against Angus McAllister. No, nor any woman neither. Thou hast strong arms to work with and a strong heart to help thee work. And what am I that I should say that all these blessings are not enough for me? If thou, good, brave, Honest man, will be troubled with sick a poor wee humble mousy as Maggie McFarlane. Why, she'll just be the proudest and happiest lassie in Adam Fries. My ain darling. They embrace. Mrs McFarlane enters from the cottage. Why, Angus, Maggie, what's a this? Mistress McFarlane, dinna be fash wi me. Dinna think worse of me than I deserve. I've loved your lassie honestly these fifteen years. But I'd never plucked up the hurt to tell her so until noo, and when she answered fairly, it was not in human nature to do all else but hold her to my hurt and place one kiss on her bonny cheek. Angus, see nee mare, my heart is there losing my only bairn, but I'm near fash wi ye. Thou a good lad, and it's been the hope of my widowed old heart to see a twain one. Thou treat her kindly, I ken that well. Thou art a prosperous, cut going man, and my mag should be a happy lass indeed. Bless thee, Angus, bless thee. Do not heed the water in my ear. It will come out when I'm over glad. Yes, I'm a fairly prosperous man, what with farming a bit of land and gillying old times and a bit of poaching now and again and what with me illicit whisky still and throwing trains off the line that the poor distracted passengers may come to my cot. I've mere ways than one of making an honest living and I'll work with them our neat and day for my bonny Meg. Die Cain, Angus. I sometimes think that thou art losing some of thine old skill at upsetting railway trains. Thou hast not done sick a thing these six weeks, and the cottage stands still, you need a sick chance custom, as the pair delay passengers may bring. Nay, mother, thou rangest him. Even now, 
this very day, has he not placed twa bonny bro sleepers across the upline, ready for the express from Glasgow, which is due in twa minutes or so? Good lad, good thoughtful lad. But I hope the unfortunate passengers will nae be much hurt, poor unconscious bodies. Fear not, mither. Lang experience has taught me to do my work deftly. The train will run off the line, and the traffic will just be bork for half a day. But I'll warrant ye that. With all this, nae mon, woman, or child among them will get so much as a bruised head or a broken nose. My ain tender-hearted Angus, he wouldn't have hurt so much as a blatherin' buzzin' blue bottle flea. Nay, Meg, not if taking care and thought could help the poor dumb thing. There, see, lass, the train's at a sandsill, and there's nae harm done. I'll just go and tell the poor distraught passengers that they may rest them here in thy cot, gin they will, till the line is cleared again. Mither, get thy rooms ready and put bros in the pot, for maybe they be hungry, poor souls. Farewell, Meg, I'll be back ere lang, and if I don't bring ye a full half dozen of well-paying passengers, thou mayst just wed the red-headed excise man. Angus exits. Oh, mother! Mother, I'm more happy. I've nae deserved sick a good fortune as to be the wife of yon brave and honest lad. Meg, thine own mither's heart is sae at the thought of losing ye, for hitherto she's just been of the world to ee. But now thou'rt cleave to thine Angus, and thou'rt learn to love him better than my poor old mither. But it mun be, it mun be. Nay, nee, mother, say not that. A good girl loves her husband with one love, and her mother with another. They are not alike, but neither is greater nor less than the other, and they dwell together in peace and unity. That is how a good girl loves. Thou art a good girl, Meg. I am a very good girl indeed, mother. A very, very good girl. I'm really sure of that. Well, the poor belated passengers will be here directly, and it is our duty to provide for them sick poor hospitality as our humble roof will afford. It shall never be said, O oh Jeanie MacFarlane, that she ever turned the weary traveller fainting from her door. My own gentle-hearted mother. Maggie and Mrs. MacFarlane exit together into the cottage. Angus enters with Belvani and Miss Belinda Traherne, who are both much agitated and alarmed. Step in, sir, step in, and sit ye doon for a wee. I'll just send Mistress MacFarlane to ye. She's a good old body and will see to your comforts, as if she were your in mither. Thank you, my worthy lad, for your kindness at this trying moment. I assure you, we shall not forget it. Ah, sir, would not any mon do as muckle? A dry shelter, a bannock, and a pan of porridge is all we can offer ye, but sick as it is, ye are heartily welcome. It is well, we thank you. But what would not help the unfortunate? Exactly, every one would. Or feed the hungry? No doubt. It just brings the teardrop to my ee to my think. My friend, would we be alone, this maiden and I? Farewell. Angus exits into the cottage. Belinda, my own, my life, compose yourself. It was in truth a weird and gruesome accident. The line is blocked, your parasol is broken, and your butterscotch trampled in the dust. But no serious harm is done. Come, be cheerful. We are quite safe. Quite safe. Safe? Oh, Balvani, my own, own Balvani. There is, I fear, no safety for us so long as we are liable to be overtaken by that fearful Major to whom I was to have been married this morning. Major McKillicuddy? I confess, I do not feel comfortable when I think of Major McKillicuddy. You know his barbaric nature and how madly jealous he is. If he should find out that I have eloped with you, he will most surely shoot us both. It is an uneasy prospect. Belinda, do you love me? With an impetuous passion that I shall carry with me to the tomb. Then be mine tomorrow. We are not far from Gretna, and the thing can be done without delay. Once married, the arm of the law will protect us from this fearful man, and we can defy him to do his worst. Belvani, all this is quite true. I love you madly, passionately. I care to live but in your heart. I breathe but for your love. Yet, before I actually consent to take the irrevocable step that will place me on the pinnacle of my fondest hopes, you must give me some definite idea of your pecuniary position. I am not mercenary, heaven knows, but business is business, and I confess I should like a little definite information about the settlements. I often think that it is deeply to be deplored that these grovelling questions of money 
should alloy the tenderest and most hallowed sentiments that inspire our imperfect natures it is unfortunate no doubt but at the same time it is absolutely necessary belinda i will be frank with you my income is one thousand pounds a year which i hold on certain conditions you know my friend chevreau hill who is travelling to london in the same train with us but in third class i believe i know the man you mean chevreau who is a young man of large property but extremely close-fisted is cursed with a strangely amatory disposition as you will admit when i tell you that he has contracted a habit of proposing marriage as a matter of course to every woman he meets his haughty father who comes of a very old family the chevreau hills had settled in this part of the world centuries before the conquest is compelled by his health to reside in madeira knowing that i exercise an all but supernatural influence over his son and fearing that his affectionate disposition would lead him to contract an undesirable marriage the old gentleman allows me one thousand pounds a year so long as chevreau shall live single but at his death or marriage the money goes over to chevreau's aunt simperson who is now travelling to town with him then so long as your influence over him lasts so long only will you retain your income that is i am sorry to say the state of the case Balvani, i love you with an imperishable ardour which mocks the power of words if i were to begin to tell you now of the force of my indomitable passion for you the tomb would close over me before i could exhaust the entrancing subject but as i said before business is business and unless i can see some distinct probability that your income will be permanent i shall have no alternative but to weep my heart out in all the anguish of maiden solitude uncared for unloved and alone belinda exits into the cottage there goes a noble-hearted girl indeed oh for the gift of chevreau's airy badinage oh for his skill in weaving a net about the hearts of women if i could but induce her to marry me at once before the dreadful major learns of our flight why not we are in scotland methinks i've heard of two loving hearts can wed in this strange country by merely making declaration to that effect i will think out some cunning scheme to lure her into marriage unaware maggie enters from the cottage will you walk in and rest a wee mr Balvoni? there's a room ready for you kind sir and you're heartily welcome to it it is well come hither maiden oh sir you do not mean any harm towards a poor innocent unprotected cottage lassie harm no of course i don't what do you mean i'm but a poor humble mountain girl but let me tell you sir that my character's just as dear to me as the richest and proudest ladies in the land before i consent to approach you swear to me that you mean me no harm harm of course i don't don't be a little fool come here there is something in his manner that reassures me it is not that of the airy trifler with innocent hearts and what would ye with poor harmless maggie mcfarlane good sir can you tell me what constitutes a scotch marriage oh sir it's no use asking me that for my heart is not my ain to give i'm betrothed to the best and noblest land in a the bonny borderland oh sir i canna be your bride my girl you mistake i do not want you for my bride can't you answer a simple question what constitutes a scotch marriage you've just to say before twa witnesses maggie mcfarlane is my wife and i've just to say mr balvoni is my husband and no one can set us asunder but sir i canna be your bride for i am betrothed to the best and noblest man i congratulate you you can go yes sir maggie exits into the cottage it is a simple process simple but yet how beautiful one thing is certain chevreau may marry any day despite my precautions and then i shall be penniless he may die and equally i shall be penniless belinda has five hundred pounds a year it is not much but it would at least save me from starvation belvani exits miss simpson and cheviot hill enter over a bridge well here we are at last yes here we are at last 
and a pretty state I'm in, to be sure. My dear nephew, you would travel third class, and this is the consequence. After all, there's not much harm done. Not much harm? What do you call that? Ten and ninepence at one operation, my glove split, one and four. My coat ruined, eighteen and six. It's a coarse and brutal nature that recognises no harm that doesn't involve a loss of blood. I'm reduced by this accident from a thinking, feeling, reflecting human being to a moral pulp, a mash, a poultice. Damn, madam, that is what I am. I'm a poultice. Chevio, my dear boy, at the moment of the accident, you were speaking to me on a very interesting subject. Was I? I, I forget what that was. The accident has knocked it clean out of my head. You were saying that you were a man of good position and fortune, that you derived £2,000 a year from your bank, that you thought it was time you settled. You then reminded me that I should come into Balvani's £1,000 a year on your marriage, and I'm not sure, but I rather think you mentioned, casually, that my goddaughter Minnie is an angel of the light. True, and just then we went off the line. To resume, Auntie Simpson, your goddaughter Minnie is an angel of the light. A perfect being, innocent as a new-laid egg. Minnie is, indeed, all that you have described her. Auntie, I'm a man of few words. I feel and I speak. I love that girl, madly, passionately, irresistibly. She is my whole life, my whole soul and body, my past, my present and my to come. I have thought of none but her. She fills my mind, sleeping and waking. She is the essence of every hope, the tree upon which the fruit of my heart is growing, my own to come. Chevio, my dear boy, excuse my tears. I won't beat around the bush. You have anticipated my devoutest wish. Chevio, my dear boy, take her. She is yours. I have often heard of rapture, but I never knew what it was till now. Auntie Simperson, bearing in mind that the fact of your income will date from the day of my wedding... When may this be? My boy, the sooner the better. Delicacy would prompt me to give Balvani a reasonable notice of the impending loss of his income. But should I, for such a mere selfish reason as that, rob the girl of one hour of happiness that you are about to confer upon her? No. Duty to the girl is paramount. On one condition, however, I must insist. This must be kept from Balvani's knowledge. You know the strange, mysterious influence that his dreadful eyes exercise over me. I have remarked it with astonishment. They are much inflamed just now, and he has to wear green spectacles. While this lasts, I am a free agent, but under treatment they may recover. In that case, if he knew that I contemplated matrimony, he would use them to prevent my doing so, and I cannot resist them. I cannot resist them! Therefore, I say, until I am safely and securely tied up, Belvani must know nothing about it. Trust me, Chevio. He shall know nothing about it from me. A thousand a year. I have endeavoured, but in vain, to woo fortune for fifty-six years. But she smiles upon me at last. She smiles upon me at last. Miss Simpson exits into the cottage. At length my hopes are to be crowned. Oh, my own, my own. The hope of my heart, my love, my life. Belvani enters, having overheard these words. Chevrio, whom are you apostrophizing in those terms? You've been at it again, I see. Belvani, that apostrophe was private. I decline to admit to you my confidence. Chevrio, what is the reason for this strange tone of defiance? A week ago, I had but to express a wish to have it obeyed as a matter of course. Belvani, it may not be denied that there was a time when, owing to the remarkable influence exercised over me by your extraordinary eyes, you could do with me as you would. It would be affection to deny it. Your eyes withered my will. They paralysed my volition. They are strange and lurid eyes, and I bowed to them. Those eyes were my fate, my destiny, my unerring must, my inevitable shall. That time has gone. Forever. Alas, for the days that are past and the good that came and went with them. Weep for them, if you will. I cannot weep with you, for I love them not. But as you say, they are past. The light that lit up those eyes is extinct. Their fire has died out. Their soul has fled. They are no longer eyes. They are poached eggs. I have not yet sunk low enough as to be a slave to two poached eggs. Have mercy! If any girl has succeeded in enslaving you, 
And I know how easily you are enslaved. Dismiss her from your thoughts. Have no more to say to her. And I will. Yes, I will bless you with my latest breath. <sighs> Whether a blessing conferred with one's last breath is a superior article to one conferred in robust health, we need not stop to inquire. I decline, as I said before, to admit to you my confidence on any terms whatever. Be gone. Belvani exits. Dismiss from my thoughts the only woman I ever loved. Have no more to say to the tree upon which the fruit of my heart is growing. No, Belvani, I cannot cut off the tree as it were gas or water. I do not treat women like that. Some men do. I don't. I am not that sort of man. I respect women. I love women. They are good. They are pure. They are beautiful. At least, m many of them are. Maggie enters from the cottage, and Chevier is very much fascinated by her. This one, for example, is very beautiful indeed. If you'll just walk in, sir, you'll find a bannock and a pan of porridge waiting for you on the table. This is one of the loveliest women I ever met in the whole course of my life. What's he glowing at? Oh, sir, you mean no harm to poor Maggie McFarlane. Pardon me, it's very foolish. I cannot account for it, but I am arrested, fascinated. Oh, good sir. What's fascinated you? I don't know. There's something about you that exercises a most remarkable influence over me. It seems to weave a kind of enchantment around me. I can't think what it is. You are a good girl, I am sure. None but a good girl could so powerfully affect me. You are a good girl, are you not? I am a very good girl indeed, sir. I am quite sure of it. I am a much better girl than 19 out of 20 in these parts. And they are all good girls too. <sighs> I cannot think what it is about you that fascinates me so remarkably. Maybe it's my beauty. Maybe it is. It is quite possible that it may be, as you say, your beauty. I am remarkably pretty. And I have a very neat figure. There is a natural modesty in this guileless appreciation of your own perfection that is, to me, infinitely more charming than the affected ignorance of an artificial town-bred beauty. Oh, sir, can I close my ear to the picture that my looking glass holds up to me twenty times a day? We see the rose on the tree, and we say that it is fair. We see the silver moon sailing in the broad blue heavens, and we say that she is bright. We see the brawling stream purling over the smooth stains of the burn, and we say that it is beautiful. And shall we close our ear to the fairest of nature's works, a pure and beautiful woman? Why, sir, it would just be base ingratitude. No, it's best to tell the truth about our things. I am a very, very beautiful girl. Maggie McFarlane, I am a plain, blunt, straightforward man, and come quickly to the point. I see more to love in you than I ever saw in a woman in all my life before. I have a large income, which I do not spend recklessly. I love you passionately. You are the essence of every hope. You are the tree upon which the fruit of my heart is growing. My past, my present, my future. You are my own to come. Tell me, will you be mine? Will you join your life with mine? Angus enters, listens in on the conversation. Ah, kind sir, I'm surely grieved to wound say true and tender a love as yours, but you're o'er late. My love is nae my aim to give you. It's given o'er to the best and bravest lad in all the bonny Bortleman. Give me his address, that I may go and curse him. You must not curse him. Oh, spare him, spare him, for he is good and brave, and he loves me oh so dearly, and I love him oh so dearly too. Oh, sir. Kind sir, have mercy on him, and do not, do not curse him, and I shall do. Will you, or will you not, oblige me by telling me where he is, that I may once go and curse him? Angus steps forward. He is here, sir, but do not waste your curses on me. Maggie, my bairn, I heard the answer you gave to this man, my true and gentle lassie. You spake well and bravely, Meg, well and bravely. Dinna heed the water in my ear. It's a tear of joy and gratitude, Meg. A tear of joy and gratitude. Oh, oh, but poor fellow. I will not curse him. Young man, I respect your honest emotion. 
I don't want to distress you, but I cannot help loving this most charming girl. Come, is it reasonable to quarrel with a man because he's of the same way of thinking as yourself? Nay, sir, I'm nay fashed, but it just seems to drive all the blood back into my hair when I think that my Meg is loved by another. Oh, sir, she is fair and a winsome lassie, and I meek as justly be angry wi ye for loving the blue heavens. She's just as far above us as they are. Oh, um, pardon me, I cannot allow that. Eh? I love that girl madly, passionately, and I cannot possibly allow you to do that. Not before my eyes, I beg. You simply torture me. Maggie turns to Angus. Leave off, dear, till the poor gentleman's gone, and then you can begin again. Angus, listen to me. You love this girl. I love her, sir, almost as well as I love myself. Then reflect how you are standing in the way of her prosperity. I am a rich man. I have money, position and education. I am much more intellectual and generally agreeable companion for her than you can ever hope to be. I am full of anecdote, and all my anecdotes are in the best possible taste. I will tell you some of them some of these days, and you can judge for yourself. Maggie, if she married me, would live in a nice house in a good square. She would have wine occasionally. She would be kept beautifully clean. Now, if you really love this girl almost as well as you love yourself, are you doing wisely or kindly in standing in the way of her getting all these good things? As to compensation, why, I've had heavy expenses of late. But if, y yes, 30 shillings... Sir, I'm poor in pocket, by the rich hair. It is rich in a pure and overflowing love. And he that hath love hath all. You canna ken what true love is, or you would not dare to insult a poor but honest lad by offering to buy his treasure for money. My in true darling. Maggie and Angus embrace. Now, I'll, I'll not have it, understand me. I'll not have it. It's simply agony to me. Angus, I respect your indignation, but you are too hasty. I do not offer to buy your treasure for money. You love her. It will naturally cause you pain to part with her. And I prescribe 30 shillings. Not, not as a cure, but as a temporary solace. If 30 shillings is not enough, why, I don't mind making it two pounds. Nay, sir, it's useless. And we ken it well, do we not, my brave lassie? Our hearts are as one as our bodies will be some day. And the man is na born. And the gold is na coined that can set us twain asunder. Angus, dear, I'm very proud of so staunch and true a love. It's like your own true self, and I can't say more for it than that. But do not act without prudence and forethought, dear. In these hard times, twa pound is twa pound, and I'm nae sure you're acting rightly in refusing so large a sum. I love you very dearly. You can that right wheel, and if you'll be troubled with sick a poor wee mousy, I'll make you a true and loving wife. But I doubt whether, well, all my love, I'll ever be worth as much to you as twa pound. Didn't act in haste, dear. Take time to think before you refuse this kind gentleman's offer. Angus turns to Chevio. Oh, sir, is this not rare modesty? Could ye match it among your toon-bred fine ladies? I think not. Meg, it shall be as you say. I'll take the cellar, but I'll be with a sair and broken hair. Fare thee well, my love, my childhood's boyhood's adulthood's love. You're ganging fra my hair to another who'll gie thy mare all the good things o' this world than I could ever gie, except love, and oh, that my hair is full indeed, but it's all for the best. You'll be happier with him, and twa pound is twa pound. Meg, make him a good wife, be true to him, and love him as ye love me. Oh, Meg! My poor bruised hair is well nigh like to break. Angus exits into the cottage in great agony. Poor laddie, poor laddie. Oh, I didn't ken till now how well he loved me. Maggie, I'm almost sorry. I, p poor lad, poor fellow. 
He has a generous heart. I am glad I did not curse him. Oh, this is weakness. Maggie, my own, ever and for always my own. We will be very happy, will we not? Oh, sir, I did a kin, but in truth I hope so. Oh, sir, my happiness is in your hands now. Be kind to the poor cottage lassie who loves ye sae well. My heart is aye your ain, and if ye forsake me, my lot will be a sair one indeed. <laughs> Maggie exits into the cottage crying. Poor little Lolan lassie. That's my idea of a wife. No ridiculous extravagance, no expensive tastes. Knows how to dress like a lady on five pound a year. Ah, and does it too. No pretense there of being blind to one's own beauty. She knows that she is beautiful and scorns to lie about it. In that respect, she resembles dear Simperson's goddaughter, Minnie. My darling Minnie. Ah, oh, my own Minnie. Minnie is fair. Maggie is dark. M Maggie loves me. That excellent and perfect country creature loves me. She is to be the light of my life. My own to come. In some respects, she is even prettier than Minnie. My darling Minnie. Simperson's dear goddaughter. The tree upon which the fruit of my heart is growing. My past, my present, my future, my own to come. But this tendency to revere is growing on me. I must shake it off. Belinda enters. Heaven and earth! What a singularly lovely girl. A stranger. Pardon me, I will withdraw. A stranger indeed, in one sense, as much as he never had the happiness of meeting you before. But, in that he has the heart that can sympathise with another's misfortune, he trusts he may claim to be regarded almost as a friend. May I ask, sir, to what misfortunes you allude? I... Uh, I do not know their precise nature, but that perception would indeed be very dull, and that the heart would be indeed flinty. But I did not at once perceive that you were very, very unhappy, except, madam, my deepest and most respectful sympathy. You have guessed rightly, sir. I am indeed a most unhappy woman. I am delighted to hear. I, I, I'm, I mean, I feel a pleasure, a melancholy and chastened pleasure. In reflecting that, if your distress is not of a peculiar nature, it may perchance lay in my power to alleviate your sorrow. Impossible, sir, though I thank you for your respectful sympathy. How many women would forego twenty years of their lives to be as beautiful as yourself, little dreaming that extraordinary loveliness can coexist with the most poignant anguish of the mind. But so, too often we find it, do we not, dear lady? Sir, this tone of address... From a complete stranger? Nay, be not unreasonably severe upon an impassionable and impulsive man, whose tongue is but too faithful herald of his heart. We see the rose on the tree, and we say that it is fair. We see the bonny brooks purling over the smooth stains, I should say stones, in the burn. And we say that it is beautiful, and shall we close our eyes to the fairest of nature's works, a pure and beautiful woman? Why? It would be base in gratitude indeed. I cannot deny that there is much truth in the sentiments you so beautifully express, but I am unhappily too well aware that, whatever advantages I may possess, personal beauty is not among their number. How exquisitely modest is that chaste insensibility to your own singular loveliness, how infinitely more winning than a bold-faced self-appreciation of an underbred country girl. I am glad, sir, that you are pleased with my modesty. It has often been admired. Pleased? I am more than pleased. That's a very weak word. I am enchanted. Madam, I am a man of quick impulse and energetic action. I feel and I speak. I cannot help it. Madam, be not surprised when I tell you that I cannot resist the conviction that you are the light of my future life, the essence of every hope, the tree upon which the fruit of my heart is growing, my past, my present, my future, my own to come. Do not extinguish that light. Do not disperse that essence. Do not blight that tree. I am well off. I am a bachelor. I am thirty-two, and I love you. Madam, humbly, truly, trustfully, patiently, paralysed with admiration, I wait anxiously, and yet hopefully, for your reply. Sir, that heart would indeed be cold that did not feel grateful for so much earnest, single-hearted devotion. 
I am deeply grieved to have to say one word to cause pain to one who expresses himself in such well-chosen terms of respectful esteem. But alas, I have already yielded up my heart to one who, if I mistake not, is a dear personal friend of your own. Uh, 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 am I to understand that you are the young lady of property whom Belvani hopes to marry? I am, indeed, that unhappy woman. And is it possible that you love him? With a rapture that thrills every fibre of my heart, with a devotion that enthralls my very soul. But there's some difficulty about his settlement. A difficulty? I should think there was. Why, on my marrying, his entire income goes over to Simpson. I could reduce him to punery tomorrow. As it happens, I am engaged, I recollect, to Simpson's goddaughter. And if Belvani dares to interpose between you and me, by George, I'll do it. Oh, spare him, sir. You say that you love me. Then for my sake, remain single for ever. It is all I ask. It is not much. Promise me that you will never, never marry, and we will both bless you with our latest breath. There seems to be a special importance attached with the blessing conferred with one's last breath that I entirely fail to grasp. It seems to convey to me no definitive advantage of any kind whatever. Cruel, cruel man. Belvani enters in great alarm. We are lost, we are lost. What do you mean? Who has lost you? Lady McKillicutty discovered your flight and followed in the next train. The line is blocked through our accident and his train has pulled up within a few yards of our own. He is now making his way to this very cottage. What do you say to that? I agree with you. We are lost. I disagree with you. I should say that you are found. This man is a reckless fire-eater. He is jealous of me. He will assuredly shoot us both if he sees us here together. I am no coward, but I confess I am uneasy. Oh, sir, you have a ready wit. Help us out of this difficulty, and we will both bless you. With our latest breath. <sighs> that decides me. Madam, remain here with me. Belvani, withdraw. I will deal with this maniac alone. All I ask is that if I find it necessary to make a statement which is not consistent with the strict truth, you, madam, will unhesitatingly endorse it. I will stake my very existence on its veracity, whatever it may be. Good. He is at hand. Belvani, go. Belvani exits. Now, madam, repose on my shoulders. Place your arms around me so. Is that comfortable? It is luxurious. Good. You are sure it does not inconvenience you? Not at all. I like it. Now, we are ready for him. McKillicuddy enters, dressed for a wedding, carrying a pistol. Where is the villain? I swear he's concealed somewhere. Search every tree, every bush, every geranium. Ha, they are here. Perjured woman, I found you at last. Save me! Belvani enters, but remains hidden, listening in on the conversation. Who is this unsightly scoundrel with whom you have flown? The unpleasant-looking scamp, whom you dared to prefer to me. Uncurl yourself from around the plain villain at once, unless you would share his fate. Major, spare him! Now, sir, perhaps you will be as good as to explain who the deuce you are and what you want with this lady. I don't know who you may be, but I'm a Gillicuddy. I am betrothed to this lady. We were to have been married this morning. I waited for her at the church from ten till four. Then I began to get impatient. Maggie and Angus enter from the cottage. <laughs> I really think you must be labouring under some delusion. Delusion? Ha <laughs> ha! Here's the cake. McKillicuddy presents a large wedding cake. Still, I think there's a mistake somewhere. This lady is my wife. What? Belinda? Oh, Belinda, tell me this unattractive man lies. Tell me that you are mine and only mine now and forever. I cannot say that. This gentleman is my husband. What? No! McKillicuddy falls to the floor, sobbing. Belvani is distraught while Maggie sobs into Angus's shoulder. End of Act One